News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, An Irish Family Affair of Murder. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are in Ireland, with a famous case in its day revolving around inheritance, land and families. Our story from 1853 near Milltown, Mulby, involves the Stackpole family. Upon the death of the patriarch of the family, his will, with an annual annuity of some £65, is directed to his nephew James, instead of the other members of his family. The other family members are unhappy with being essentially skipped over, and a plan is hatched by them to obtain the inheritance before it comes into effect on James's 21st birthday. A horrific case of family murder for land and inheritance is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. The Stackpole family, County Clare, 1853. The Stackpole family consists of James Stackpole, 20 years of age and the main inheritor of his deceased uncle's will upon his attainment of his 21st birthday. Should James die before his 21st birthday, the estate is to be transferred to his uncle Thomas. James's uncle Thomas, about 60 years of age, Honor Stackpole, Thomas his wife, Richard Stackpole, brother of Thomas, and Bridget Stackpole, Richard's wife. Thomas, as inheritor if James dies, brings in the other family members with promises of a slice of the inheritance if they help him kill James. But James's death must take place before he inherits at his 21st birthday. After James inherits, the rest of the family are permanently cut out. It was said in the papers that the choice of James as the inheritor was due to his industrious nature. In comparison, his uncle Thomas was said to lead a drunken, dissipated life. From the Cork Examiner, the 27th of September, 1852, Michael Kenny Esquire, solicitor, sworn... In the month of February last, an uncle of the deceased James Stackpole died in Dover, and after his death, his widow wrote to him, Michael Kinney, solicitor, to say the property over which he, Mr. Kenny, was agent, was willed to James Stackpole, now deceased, and that Thomas Stackpole was left nothing on account of his dissipated habits. He continued that Thomas Stackpole at the time stated that he, Thomas, had the best right to the property and would take no heed of any will. The Crime James is invited to his uncle's house for tea. A meal is prepared that James enjoys with his uncle and then after some conversation he goes to bed. Whilst James sleeps, the four enter and kill James by brutally beating him on the head with tongs and candlesticks. They also involve Thomas's servant, James Halpin, in helping to kill James. It is thought that they had involved the servant in the hopes that if anything went wrong, he would get the blame. Reportedly, James had put up a tremendous defence against his family assailants, but he was overpowered. The final blow came from the axe of his uncle Thomas, and then James's body is mutilated. An attempt is made to remove the evidence by having the two women take what remains of James and carry the corpse nearly two miles where they partially bury it in the sand. The following day, James's brutalised remains are discovered by a young lad. James's clothes are beside him, helping to identify the mangled body. This would be important, as James must be acknowledged as dead in order for the inheritance 
to pass to Thomas. From the Dublin Evening Mail, the 22nd of September, 1852. Dreadful murder in Clare. It is my painful duty to have to inform you of the perpetration in this hitherto quiet and peaceable locality of as barbarous and revolting a murder as ever disgraced society. True it is, it cannot be classed in that fearful category of murders denominated agrarian, yet, nevertheless, the circumstances connected with it tend to render it particularly atrocious. The victim was a young man named James Stackpole, who had not numbered twenty summers. The reputed murderer, his uncle. It would appear that the unfortunate deceased was to have come into possession of property to the extent of sixty or seventy pounds per annum on attaining his majority, and that, in the event of any calamity befalling him, this annuity would revert to the uncle, Thomas Stackpole, as next of kin. For our listeners, the £65 is equivalent of an annual sum of about £10,000. The night of Saturday last, the deceased arrived at his uncle's house, having been previously invited to spend the following Sunday with him, and shortly after his arrival it would appear the diabolical act was committed, which sent the unfortunate young man to an early grave. His mutilated remains were found on Sunday afternoon some distance from the uncle's house, at a place near the sand hills. The skull, dreadfully battered, his cap on his head, nearly clean, and having the appearance of being put on after the murder, and his boots lying near his head, was also clean, and just as if they had been deliberately placed there. It is said that in consequence of the uncle having absented himself on Sunday, suspicion was aroused, and he and his family arrested soon after the body was found. A little child of his becoming alarmed afterwards, began to cry out, and said it was not she who did it, and named some parties whom she said committed the foul deed in the house on Saturday night, while the deceased was in bed. The inquest was held on yesterday, and I understand that a man named Richard Stackpole surrendered himself to the police shortly before it, and intimated his readiness to reveal the entire circumstance. His account is similar to the child's, but more detailed, and implicates the uncle and the aunt of the deceased, Richard Stackpole, the informer himself and wife, and the servant boy of Thomas Stackpole, the uncle. It appears that the deceased, James Stackpole, made great resistance, and there is a cut between the forefinger and thumb of one hand, as if received in warding off the murderous blows of his cruel assailant, and the same arm is also cut in several places. After the murder was committed, it is said one of the women carried him on her back to the spot in which the body was found. The coroner's jury returned a verdict in accordance with the circumstances, and the accused parties will be forwarded to Ennis Jail today to stand their trial at next spring's assizes for this county. The inhabitants of this district evince the utmost horror at the perpetration, the foul deed, and no one could be got yesterday to take charge of the house of the wretched man, Thomas Stackpole. After the murder, Bridget and Honorer get to work attempting to wash away the signs of struggle and the bloodbath of the scene of the crime. They fail. Constable May, in investigating James's house, finds traces of blood splatter, thereby confirming that James was indeed killed in his own home. However, the crime is committed in front of the children who have no compunction of sharing with the police and tearfully recounting the crime that they have witnessed. 
The inquest that rapidly follows unfolds the crime in detail, and, not unexpectedly, one of the party tells on the other family members in hopes of saving his own skin. From the Cork Examiner, the 27th of September, 1852, the murder near Milltown, Malbay. The Munster News has the following report of the inquest, which was held on Monday in this horrible and mysterious crime. The first witness sworn was Thomas May, constable, who deposed that in consequence of information obtained by him, he proceeded to Bedford Bridge on Sunday morning at about eleven o'clock and found the body of James Stackpole there. The place is in the townland of Anna. The deceased cap and boots were laid near him, and his coat was thrown over his face. Portions of his skull and brains were scattered on his waistcoat. There was a dreadful cut on the head near the neck, and a cut on his left hand. His shirt was stiff with blood, and from the manner in which witness found him, he must have been killed in bed and dressed afterwards. Mary Flanagan sworn. Mary was working on Friday and Saturday last with Thomas Stackpole. She saw James Stackpole deceased there at the house between the hours of five and six o'clock on the evening of Saturday. The deceased was in the parlour of Thomas Stackpole and ate his dinner there. No person was along with them then. The witness went home on that evening and returned again on Sunday evening when she was sent for and put in some corn to be threshed on the next day. Constable May recalled he stated he went with Mr. Burdett Moroni to Stackpool's house on Sunday, the 19th instant, at about one o'clock. Here he saw Honor Stackpool, wife of Thomas Stackpool, Mary Flanagan, and two other women going to and fro as if on the lookout for some person. Mr. Moroni and Isaac Bolton, the sub-constable, accompanied him, and Bolton were in official clothes and stopped at the door. He told the woman to go in before them, which she did. Thomas Stackpole and John Halpin were in the house at the time. Halpin was standing, and Thomas Stackpole was sitting on the chair with his head between his hands and hands supported by his knees. Constable May then told the whole party to consider themselves prisoners, and Mr. B. Moroni told them that, as magistrate, he would search the house. Mr. B. Moroni then said that all parties accused should be present in order that they should hear what would be proved against them and they should be produced in court. Constable May then ordered Sub-Constable Bolton to handcuff Stackpole. Constable May saw at the time signs of blood on the wall and spots of blood on the table under where it was on the wall. He then proceeded to the room adjoining the kitchen and found in a box a towel with spots of blood on it. It was recently washed. He went to a second room and found a blue cloth cloak. Part of it was wet as if it had been washed and wrung with the hands. There was a spot of blood on it larger than a five-shilling piece. He found in the same room a petticoat hanging on the window shutter. It was also wet and appeared to have been recently washed. He went out to the porch and found a large pot with dirty water. It appeared to be mixed with the colour of the petticoat and blood. He went upstairs where he saw on the boards spots of blood. In the bedroom and on the wall of the room he found spots of fresh blood and stains of blood on one part of the floor near the bed. The floor looked as if it had been recently washed. He found on the bed a pillow spotted with blood, and on the opposite side of the room, under the window, a coarse sheet with some spots of blood on it. 
and part of it wet. He also found in the box two shirts stained with blood. Mr. F. G. Moroni asked the prisoners what they had to say. Thomas Stackpole stated that he was drunk on Saturday night and fell and received a cut on his head. He bled so much that his shirt and towel were spattered with blood. The prisoner then made a long statement of the particulars of the wound stated by him to have been received while intoxicated. The examination of the constable was then resumed. Constable May arrested Thomas Stackpole and his wife and the servant, Halpin. He then proceeded to the house of Richard Stackpole on account of it being stated that the cloak belonged to his wife. He found no signs at his house. Constable May removed all the prisoners to Milltown Barracks in custody of the police party. He arrested Richard Stackpole's wife. Her name is Biddy and on that day arrested Richard Stackpole. He examined all the prisoners' clothes, their bodies and legs, and found a large spot of blood on John Halpin's leg above the knee. It was on suspicion that the witness arrested Richard Stackpole. After his arrest, he was told not to say anything that would incriminate himself, as it would be given in evidence against him. Richard Stackpole stated that he would tell the truth as they were hanging each other already. He stated that he would tell all he knew and hoped it would save his own neck, as it was thought he would be hanged and all the rest left at liberty. Richard Stackpole continued to say on Saturday last, Thomas Stackpole came to my house. It was late in the evening, and I went out along with him on the road, and then he asked to go up to the house. Thomas said that now was the time or never, as James Stackpole was sleeping upstairs, and they would kill him and have the property, and that perhaps they would never again get the same opportunity of him. I said I was against doing the act, and he, Thomas Stackpole, gave me a blow of a small stick on the back. I then went on before him, and until I went to the gate, I went on one side, and he stood near the stile for a long time. When he went in, I turned back and went to my own house. When he, Thomas, thought it was too long I was away, his wife, Honor Stackpole, came for me. I came with the wife to Thomas Stackpole's house. When I went in, he was standing in the middle of the kitchen in his flannel waistcoat and drawers, and he was cursing us all as we were not going on with the murder. To gratify him, I went upstairs, accompanied by Halpin and Honora Stackpole. When I went in where James, the deceased, was sleeping, I did not like to strike him a blow in the bed. I dragged him out of the bed and then pulled him downstairs by a great struggle. The deceased James had always a hold of me. I had the iron tongs in one hand and a hold of him with the other, and Thomas Stackpole also had a hold of him. When Thomas Stackpole saw that I was not using the tongs properly, he took it himself and gave the deceased a blow on the head, and then he he, James, fell. I gave him four or five blows when he was down. I also gave him four or five blows on the back with the tongs. He was then gasping for death. Halpin also gave him a blow of a candlestick and broke it on his head. I went home then, and my wife was after me. When she came home, she told me the deceased was dressed and a sheet was around his head, and that the body was put on her back, and she never stopped until she left the corpse at the bridge before stated, a distance of about two miles. John Costello, Esquire, M.D., sworn. Mr. Costello confirmed that he had held a post-mortem examination. 
and the deceased's frontal bone and parietal bones of the head were broken, and the occipital bone and lower jaw were also broken. The deceased had a contused wound on the right and left shoulders. He had also a slight wound to the left hand, and appearances were presented as if there had been an attempt at strangulation. All were sufficient to cause death. The jury immediately, without retiring from the box, returned the following verdict. We find that Richard Stackpole, Thomas Stackpole, Bridget Stackpole and John Halpin are guilty of the willful murder of James Stackpole, who was murdered on Saturday night last. A great deal of merit is due to Constable May of the Milltown Station and his party for tracing the parties charged with the murder at once and arresting them. All parties will be brought to trial. Thomas becomes quite ill whilst in prison awaiting his trial, hence there is a delay on the prosecuting trial. Instead, Richard Stackpole, who had already confessed the whole of the crime and his part in it, has his trial first, with more evidence produced. Honour Stackpole, the wife of Thomas, also has charges brought against her. John Halpin, Thomas's servant, who he says was pressed into aiding in the murder, testifies against the others and avoids execution. Presiding over by the Honourable Justice Perrin, the Crown Court convened at Ennis on Wednesday, the 23rd of February, 1853. Testimony unfolds, narrated by witnesses such as Michael Mulqueeny, who stumbled upon James's lifeless form, and John Halpin, the servant embroiled in the grim affair. Notably, 11-year-old Anne Stackpole, who was an eyewitness to the harrowing events, provides a detailed account of the fateful night. Richard's defence attempt was to cast doubt on witness testimony, but it was unavailing. The subsequent trials of Bridget and Honora unfolded with similar gravity. Both women ultimately convicted based on the compelling evidence presented. Meanwhile, Thomas's ailing health postponed his trial to a later date, awaiting the next assizes. From the West Britain and Cornwall Advertiser, the 11th of March, 1853, the Stackpole murder. Richard Honour and Bridget Stackpole have been convicted at the assizes of the brutal murder of their nephew, James Stackpole, were on Saturday sentenced to be executed on the 29th of April. Thomas Stackpole, uncle of the murdered man also charged with the crime, could not be tried as he at present lies at the point of death in jail. It appears on the trial that the unfortunate deceased had been invited to the house and dragged out of bed at night in the presence of children the object being to get possession of a trifling property which he had inherited. The prisoners received the sentence with the most extraordinary self-possession and left the bar without saying a word. But the male was heard to say when he was going down the stairs of the dock, it is too bad that three lives should be taken for one. The looming executions scheduled for Friday the 29th of April 1853 drew a substantial crowd as preparations began in the early hours of the morning outside Ennis Jail. Among the throngs of onlookers a sombre atmosphere pervaded as the gallows took shape. Given the limitations of the gallows only two prisoners could be accommodated at once prompting a decision to hang Richard and Bridget first. Their wish to face death together was a rare occurrence, as usually the tensions of incarceration often strained relationships to the breaking point, with one 
blaming the other for their dire circumstances. From the Cork Constitution, the 3rd of May, 1853, the execution of the Stackpools, on Friday the extreme sentence of the law was carried into effect in Ennis against the three Stackpools, Richard, Honorer and Bridget Stackpool, convicted at the last Clare Assizes of the murder of their nephew, James Stackpool, at Milltown Maltby on the 18th of last September. The prisoners made no confession of their guilt or declaration of their innocence on the drop. The women did not seem to be so reconciled to their fate as the male convict, who appeared quite resigned to die. The struggle did not last more than a couple of minutes when life in each was extinct. As the place of execution is differently constructed from that in Clommel, only two could be suffered together, and owing to a wish expressed by the parties, Richard Stackpole and his wife Bridget were executed together. The wretched culprits evinced considerable firmness in mounting the ladder by which the scaffold is approached. There were two executioners employed, and while one of them was adjusting the rope round the neck of the female, she called to him in Irish to squeeze it well, and after the caps had been drawn over their faces, the fatal bolt was drawn, and both were launched into eternity. After being suspended for three quarters of an hour, the bodies were lowered, and shortly before two o'clock, the other ill-fated being, Honorer Stackpole, whose husband, Thomas, would also have been tried last assizes, but that he was ill, was conducted to the place of execution. She appeared considerably weaker than the others, and when she gained the platform, she turned round towards the reverend gentleman in attendance, who addressed some observations to her, after which she appeared to continue praying almost fervently until the dreadful fall which terminated her earthly career. None of the parties appeared to struggle much, the height they fell being about six feet. Thomas Stackpole still continues very weak, as he has been labouring under dysentery almost from the time of his committal in September last. There have been 46 persons executed in this county since the year 1830. Later that day, all three bodies were interred within the confines of the prison grounds. As for Thomas, who arguably was the instigator of the crime, he remained in ill health within jail. He did seem to rally enough when it was thought that he could be placed on trial. From the Cork Examiner, the 13th of July, 1853, the trial of Thomas Stackpole, brother to Richard Stackpole, brother-in-law to Bridget Stackpole, and husband to Honorer Stackpole, who were executed on the 29th of April last for this barbarous murder, which was postponed last assizes in consequence of the prisoner's indisposition was postponed in Ennis again for the same cause. The prisoner is a man of about 65 years of age, and although kept alive since March last by stimulants, has been all the time confined to his bed, and is but very little stronger than he was on the last occasion when the medical officer of the jail gave evidence to the effect that he was totally unfit to be put on trial. Thomas Stackpole dies in prison. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, an Irish family affair of murder. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are Wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are Frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. 
Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.